Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, we reach the end of the second week of our listener support campaign. To participate in this year's campaign, we need to hear from you by March 16th. Um, during the listener support campaign, in addition to sending you access to our premium site, which we always do throughout the year for all donations of $7 or more, uh, at the uh, uh, $20 level, we will send you an additional thank you gift plus a copy of my ebook, All I Needed to Know, I Learned from Columbo. Among some of the gifts offered at the $50 level, we have a Radio Archives uh, gift certificate that will allow you to purchase one of their small six or seven uh, hour uh, radio sets as a download. These are high f- fidelity, high quality audio, and uh, just a, a really nice treat. And again, that is at the uh, $50 level. At the $100 level, we have a copy of the audiobook of uh, Tales of the Dim Night. Uh, really, uh, we had uh, Scott Wilcox read that. He just did a fantastic job and, uh, you know, try to give the characters different voices. And uh, it's just a wonderful lesson and uh, is available at the $100 level. Uh, and you can read about all the different options at support.greatdetectives.net. Uh, also this weekend, we have a couple of articles going up at greatdetectives.net. For Saturday, uh, I offer my review of Dossier on Demetrius, the first ever a uh, major Gregory Keane uh, serial from Australia. Then on Sunday, uh, we continue our countdown of radio's most essential people with number 10 on the list. So you can check those out at greatdetectives.net. You can also subscribe to the articles uh, through the Kindle store if you have a Kindle. Now it's time for today's episode of the lineup, The Elsner Case. Ladies and gentlemen, By transcription, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is The Lineup. figure I was getting all this. I thought all I had to do was to tell you what I saw in Whitegate Park last night. That is all you have to do, Sidney. Here, sit down. It'll only take a few minutes. We want to see if you can identify the man in the park who walked past the bench where you and your girl were, that's all. We picked up someone who fits the description you gave us. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, like I said, Lieutenant, uh, Gloria, my girl, that is, uh, was repairing her lipstick when this guy sauntered by. Boy, imagine me putting a finger on a murderer. Hold it, Sidney. Just look and listen, huh? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, their name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, have him held. The officers who took your name will assist you. They're seated among you. Oh, what do I tell the guys in the block about this, huh, Lieutenant? Your identification. When the prisoners leave here, they are sent to the bathroom and dressed back into their jail clothes. It makes it quite difficult to bring them back after they leave here. The questions I ask these suspects are merely to get a natural tone of voice. So do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often lie. Bring on the line. All right, boys. All right, let's move. This way, over to the end of the stage. 
That's it. Now turn and face the front. Hands to your sides. Look straight ahead. Number one, Charles Helpser, assault. Why were you fighting, Charles? It was self-defense, Daddy. Wish I was dead. Talk up, Charles. It was self-defense, Daddy. Wish I was dead. Witnesses say you started it, Charles. Saying witnesses are talking about liars. His money. Number two, Maurice Calder, drunk and disorderly on private property. What do you mean, Maurice? It all depends on the weather. Why did you start at the service in the theater lobby? I was drunk, I guess. Anyhow, when I got inside, I found out I'd already seen the picture and they wouldn't give him a 40 cents back. Number three, Jimmy Vetter, vagrancy. How long have you been in town, Vetter? 61 years, Sergeant. I don't know if I was born here. There, Lieutenant. That so one. You, uh, like I told you, bald him with a nose as flat as a pancake. Sergeant Graham. Uh, yes, Lieutenant. Number three, hold for interrogation. <laughs> I'll be back in a few minutes, Ben. Okay, Matt. Come in, Vetter. Sit down over there. Yes, sir. We want a few facts, Vetter. Early this morning, an unidentified woman of about 60 was found choked to death in the park. A nice-looking unidentified woman of about 60, Vetter. Nice-looking until she was strangled. So? So the coroner says she was murdered sometime between 9 and 11 last night. I, I don't get it, Lieutenant. This morning, I'm picked up in an alley sleeping off a snoot food. Now, this was the connection. A kid who was necking in the park last night, not 50 feet away from the dead woman. That's the connection, Vetter. A kid who read about the killing in this morning's paper and came in and gave us a description of the man he saw in the park at a little after 11. I still don't get it. I... Well, then try this. The description the kid gave us was a bald man with a nose flat as a pancake who keeps sniffing all the time. That, Vetter, is the reason we picked you up. Not for sleeping in an alley. No, no. And just to make it all real tight, Five minutes ago, the kid identified you in the lineup. No, no, that ain't so. He, he couldn't have. It was dark there in the park. And, uh, okay, Lieutenant, I was in the park, all right. I might as well save us both a lot of time and tell you the rest. You killed a venom? A stick up that got out of hand when she started to yell? No, Lieutenant. She was dead when I got there. Could I have a smoke, Lieutenant? Yeah. I was walking through the park, Lieutenant, looking for a good spot to flop for the night when I saw something shiny off in the bushes away. This here house key. When I bent down to pick it up, I saw the body. She was dead like a doornail. And there was no one around? You sure of that? Positive. I looked good. Anyhow, I was flat broke, so I went through a pocket. She didn't have no pocketbook. Just a buck and a half and change in a coat. That's all I took, and I beat it. I walked slow past those kids on the bench so they wouldn't be suspicious. That's all, Lieutenant, the truth, so help me. The lineup's finished, Ben. Is there anything I can do? Yeah. Turn Vetter here over to Sergeant Quine, will you, Matt? I'm gonna hold him on suspicion of murder. Oh, Lieutenant, I already told Let's you. Let's go, Vetter. Be right back, Ben. All right. Hi, Becker. Hi, man. Good morning, Lieutenant. Here's the first report on that body in Whitegate Park. Not much. No identification yet, Becker. Mm mm. And it may be a while. Most of the stuff she was wearing was homemade and home washed, so no labels and no laundry mark. Mm hmm. Also, there's no record of her prints here or in Washington. Coroner's office is checking on her dental work now. Call you as soon as we get something, Lieutenant. All right. Hey, Matt. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> well, Ben, what did Becker have? Does it look like Jimmy Vetter? Maybe, I don't know. He says he was walking through the park, spotted this key, and then the body. Admits robbing it no more. Mm-hmm. Well, where do we go from here, Ben? Well, until we get something on the body. This key, I guess. Come on, let's check with Harrison on the robbery detail. Get a listing of locksmiths. Lieutenant, you may be lucky at this key. Now, how's that, Harrison? One thing, the number punched on it, but the locksmith had turned it out. This G-104 here is a local serial number. Mm-hmm. Get the name and address out of the file in a minute. But better than that, the key itself is for a Brasso Dunlap lock. It's pretty rare in this part of the country, so the locksmith may remember who he made it for. <laughs> of course, only Yale or Master Padlock wouldn't stand a chance. Well, don't locksmiths have to keep a record on each key they turn out, Harrison? No, no, Sergeant. Only keep a record when they make a key for a specific lock, not when they make a key for key. Now, well, let's see who G-104 is. E, F, E, 80, 
Twenty-five, one, one, three. One, oh, four. Here we are. Uh, Wallerman Key Shop, 3920 South Clement Avenue. You right with you, Jack? Fine. Well, cross your fingers, Matt, and hope he's part elephant. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, gents, what can I do for you? We're from the police department, Mr. Wallerman. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Greb. We'd like to ask you about a key. Oh? Key I made? Yeah. This key, Mr. Wallerman. Do you happen to know who you made it for? Hmm. Perhaps so Dunlop, huh? Don't often make one of these once, twice a year. Good luck, all right. But it, it's unusual. Well, what is it, Mr. Wallerman? You remember something? Yeah. Bad temper. Sure. About two months ago, I was a guy with nice clothes and a nice way of talking until he got sore. Yeah, I remember now. Said I took too long. I was a, a, a blundering idiot. That's it. You know this man's name? Uh-uh. His address? No, I don't. But he does live in the neighborhood. How do you know that? Because I've seen him a couple of three times at Tommy Lowe's place. Tommy runs a Chinese hand laundry over the next block. This bird must be a customer of his. What does this man look like? Oh, he's kind of tall, thin face, sharp nose, but don't worry. Tommy Lowell will know him, officer. Just mention his temper. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Uh, no man you speak of very well. Uh, his name, Mr. Leonard Elster. He lived... 105 Duane Boulevard. Yes? Mrs. Elsner? That's right. And uh, we're from the police department, Mrs. Elsner. I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Graham. Well, how do you do? Mrs. Elsner. And uh, Mrs. Elsner, is your husband at home? We'd like to talk to him. Yes, he's inside listening to the radio. Just a moment now, Colin. Oh. Excuse me. Sure. Oh, Leonard. Leonard. Uh, see if that key fits, will you, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It works all right, then. Uh-huh. Uh, here's Elsner. Now, uh, Mr. Elsner, I'm Lieutenant Guthrie. This is Sergeant Graham. We'd like a few words with you, please. Very well. Living room is this way, gentlemen. Thank you. Oh, uh, Mrs. Elson, if you don't mind, we'd like to talk to your husband alone. Of course. All right, dear. Sit down, gentlemen. Frankly, I'm curious to know what this is about. Do you mind telling me? Well, it's about a woman, Mr. Elson. An elderly, unidentified woman who was found choked to death in the park last night. What? Woman choked to death? I, I don't understand. You want to talk to me about that? That's right. Tell me, Mr. Elson, did you read about this in the newspapers? No, I haven't seen the paper today. Do you mind telling us what you did last night? I stayed home. All evening, Mr. Elson? Yes, all evening. Now, what is this all about? Uh, Mr. Elson, do you uh, recognize this key? Of course. My house key. One just like it. Do you have your house key with you now, Mr. Elson? I do. Together with all my keys. Here. How many house keys are there? Uh, for everyone who lives here, I mean. Three, four, five, maybe. I don't know. They're all around. And does the maid have one? She does. At least she let herself in with one a few minutes before you arrived. And your wife, Miss Delson, she has a key, of course. Of course. Now, look here, enough of this. Why all these stupid questions about house keys? What, if anything, do they have to do with the woman who was strangled in Whitegate Park last night? Well? Well, this key was found near the body, Mr. Elsner, and there were signs of a struggle. Which could mean that whoever killed the woman dropped this key. Your key. But I have my house key. I just showed it to you. There. And I'm sure my wife does, too. And what about extra keys? Are they around? I couldn't say. House keys are famous for getting lost, Lieutenant. Did you ever lose one? Since you've been in this house? Yes, yes. About two or three months ago. Where'd you lose it? Here, at home, in the street? I don't know. It wouldn't be lost if I did. Leonard, Leonard, darling, your temper, please. Control yourself, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I'll be glad to answer your questions. Uh... Carol, you'd better leave it there. No, that won't be necessary, Mr. Elsman. Now, about last night, you say you were here? Yes. Carol here went to Bazaar. Uh, what was it again, dear? The Woman's Auxiliary of the North Point Country Club. I'm chairman. 
We're raising money to build a new clubhouse next spring. Mm-hmm, I see. Mr. Elsner, did you have any callers last night? Any visitors of any kind? Yes, I did. Can you remember them specifically? I think so. There was the newsboy. He was making his weekly collection about uh, nine, I'd say. Uh, for what paper, Mr. Elsner? The Evening Star. And uh, anyone after that, Mr. Elsner? Two people. Uh, along about ten, a delivery boy from the liquor store, a uh, king. He brought two bottles of scotch. At 10.30, a friend of my wife's dropped in looking for uh, Ruth Millard. She lives at the Park, Netherlands. She stayed about 20 minutes. We watched a television show together, a quiz show called Number, Please. A Brooklyn housewife won the jackpot. Some question about Skynet. Then in. Gentlemen, at uh, 11, I had a long-distance person-to-person call from a Mr. Saul Meadow. Toy jobber in Des Moines, Iowa. I manufacture toys. Now, is there anything else? No, sir. Uh, not right now, anyway. We'll be in touch. Good night, Mrs. Elsner. Good night. Good night, Sergeant. Good night, ma'am. Good night, Mr. Elsner. Good night. <sighs> you know, Matt, Mr. Elsner said he didn't read about the killing in the paper. So? So I'd like to know how he knew it happened in Whitegate Park. We never mentioned the park by name. Next Sunday, CBS brings you an exciting, timely appraisal of the world situation and some of the answers when ten top CBS correspondents are heard in a special broadcast entitled The Challenge of the Fifties, Years of Crises. For the past month, these famous CBS reporters have been interviewing world leaders. On next Sunday's broadcast, you'll hear on special recordings what these leaders predict. Edward R. Murrow will be the moderator. Don't miss this unusual, significant broadcast, The Challenge of the Fifties, Next Sunday afternoon on most of these same CBS stations. Uh, did you get that, Willis? On Walnut, yes. King's Liquor Store. They're supposed to have sent two bottles of scotch to Elsner last night about uh, 1020. Yeah. And get a hold of the newsboy who collects for that route, will you? It's the evening star. Yeah, that's right. And uh, put a tracer on a person-to-person call else and claims he got it at 11 from a Saul Meadows in Des Moines. Yeah. I want every bit of that alibi check. Right. You know, Ben, personally, I think you're wasting your time. What, checking Elson's alibi? Yeah, yeah, it sounds good to me. Too many people involved to be a phony. Well, uh, we'll see. There's something wrong there someplace, Matt. Well, the key maker backs up Elsinor in his story about losing the key. For my money, you're reaching quite a ways to tie a well-to-do guy like Elsinor into a threadbare old lady dead in a public park. Why would he do it, Ben? That's what beats me. Why? You got me. Well, anyway, I'd go easy if I were you. Elsinor's the kind of bird that really blows his lid over a false arrest. In fact, there was... uh... Come in. Call, Lieutenant. Matt? Hi, Becca. Well, we got an identification on the old lady in Whitegate Park. Good. We traced the shoes. They'd been half-sold lately, and we finally located the shoemaker. A guy way out in the Henning District. He just now identified the body. Well, who is she? Edna Clooney, 4412 Durban Street. That's a walk up, and it checks out. Who'd you talk to there, Becca? A landlady, a Mrs. Peters. She says Mrs. Clooney's had a room there for about six months. Let's go, man. Believe it. She was such a sweet little old thing. Why, terrible, that's what it is. Down this way, gentlemen. Thank you. When did you say it happened? And last night, Mrs. Peters, sometime between 9 and 11. Didn't you notice she was gone today, ma'am? No, I didn't, Sergeant. Sometimes I go a week or more without seeing all my tenants, especially the quiet ones. Now, this is her door here. Ooh, all right. Duffy in here. I'd better open the window. No, I wouldn't bother. We won't be here long. Yeah, we just want to look around. Maybe she kept a date book or a diary or something. If she did, it'd be over there on that table with the drawer. Oh, here, huh? 
Oh, she was sure a tidy housekeeper. She was a nice, sweet woman, Sergeant. One of the best tenants I ever had. It... Oh, it's just terrible. I can't imagine... Now, this picture, who... Mrs. Peters, who is it? Do you know? Why, yes, that's her. Oh, my goodness. Now, what's the matter? That's Jim, her son. Why, that boy doesn't even know yet that his mother was... is dead. Is he here in town? Well, as far as I know, he lives over on the south side someplace, works in a mill over there, a stamping mill, I think. You wouldn't know the name then, huh? Could it be uh, McClellan and Lamb? She's got a metal ashtray here and a letter opener, both stamped with the uh, compliments of McClellan and Lamb, 1024 South Market. Now, let's try it. Now, Mrs. Peters, leave everything just as it is and keep this room locked, will you? We may be back. Must be him, Ben. You the fellows who wanted to see me? I'm Jim Clooney. Yeah, and yeah, let's go inside here, Jim. Out of this noise where we can talk. Go ahead, Jim. I'm Lieutenant Ben Guthrie. This is Sergeant Greb. I'm from the police department, Jim. Police? What do you want with me? No, wait, wait, wait. I'm afraid we've got some bad news for you. It's your mother. We... Mom? What's happened to her? Is she hurt? It's worse than that, fella. She's dead, Jim. Dead? It happened last Sunday night. Her body was found in Whitegate Park. Park? But how? She was murdered, Jim. Mom? Murdered? Who did it? We don't know. But maybe you can help us. Just answer some questions. Sure. Go ahead. I, I'm okay. What do you want to know? When did you see your mother last, Jim? Yesterday afternoon. About one o'clock, I guess. Buddy drove me out to her place. Lieutenant, I don't get this. Mom never went out at night, or maybe once or twice to a movie, but the park, she never went in there. When, uh, when you were with her, did she seem upset about anything? No, not a bit. We just sat around and talked like always. Now, what did you talk about? Anything special? No, the same old things. My job, my draft, my gas station. You've got a gas station, Jim? Oh, it's not really mine. It's one I'd like to have. It's out on Grand. The guy's going to sell out and retire. He used to talk about me buying it and going into business for myself. I'll never have that kind of money. Yesterday, Mom was kidding around that she was going to borrow the down payment for me. She ran into a wealthy old friend, she said. Well, who was that, Jim? Well, some guy she knew 25 years ago. I worked for the same company up in Evanston for a while after my dad died. Uh-huh. She hadn't seen this guy since then, but, well, she ran into him on the street last week and recognized him. She got a big kick out of it. Did she mention his name? Yeah, it um, was Melvin something. Um, Melvin, um, Melvin Berry it was. You know where we can get in touch with him? No. Why do you want him? Well, maybe your mother wasn't kidding about borrowing the money, I mean. Mothers are funny where their kids are concerned, you know. Oh, by the way, uh, did you ever hear of a Leonard Elsner? Lives up on Dwayne Boulevard? Leonard Elsner? No, I... Wait a minute. That's funny. What's funny, Jim? But you mentioned that Dwayne Boulevard. Why? What about it? Why, Mom used to go up there quite a bit. She used to take a bus to the library up there and... And what, Jim? I... I think she said that that's where she was, coming out of the library when she ran into this Melvin Berry. Lieutenant Guthrie? Yeah, about 30 minutes ago, Matt. He was on his way down to the file. Oh, okay, thanks. Ben? Yeah, back here, Matt. Oh. Any luck? Yeah. Oh, we had to dig back into the desk for this one. Have a look. Melvin Berry escaped from the penitentiary February 1930. Uh-huh. Evanston had him for embezzlement. Tried and convicted up there in December 1929. Got five years. He's a nice-looking guy. Pretty dapper with that mustache. Matt, you see what I see. Huh? No, I guess not. Well, look. Skip the mustache. Forget it. The eyes, Matt. The eyes. Holy smoke. You weren't wasting your time checking on that alibi after all, Ben. Lieutenant Guthrie, 
Good. Put him on. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Willis. What? The checks? All of it? You sure? Okay. Okay, Willis. That's all. Don't tell me. Yeah, Helson's alibi is airtight. That's almost impossible. Matter of fact. Let's go, Matt. Go where? To the Elson residence, 105 Duane Boulevard. But you just said. I that... know what I said. Let's go. Now, look, Jeffrey, when you fellows were here before, I tried my best to cooperate. I know, I know. But we found out a few things since then. We want to find out a few more. Like what? Well, for one thing, there are four parks in this city. That's an interesting bit of information. So how did you know the murder took place at Whitegate? You said you hadn't read about it? Neither of us mentioned Whitegate. Why, it's a perfectly natural assumption. That's the largest park in town. I, I, I simply assume... For another thing, we had a long talk with Jim Clooney today. He's the dead woman's son. He told us how his mother ran into an old friend right out here on Dwayne Boulevard. She hadn't seen the man in 25 years. So what? If you've got a point, get to it or get out of here. Then I... Leonard, please. I'll get to it, Mr. Elsner. The man's name was Melvin Berry. Leonard? Be quiet, girl. Go on, Guthrie. We checked on him. He was convicted of embezzlement up in Evanston back in 1929. Escaped from prison in 1930. He was never caught. Of course, we have his picture in prints. It won't be any trouble. I don't know what you're talking about. If this is some crazy way of accusing me of murder, then arrest me. Go on. Go on. Nobody's accusing you of murder, Elsner. We know you didn't do it. Huh? But you... Of course not. You were home here. Your alibi checked all the way. That's right. But there are all the circumstances. We can't ignore them in spite of a perfect alibi. You know, Mrs. Elson, a life like that uh, Melvin Berry lives must be a... Well, must be pretty miserable. Constantly afraid that the next time he turns around, somebody will recognize him. Always under a shadow of fear. No matter how successful he is... There's always the dread that sometime, someplace, someone will know him. Don't you think so, Mrs. Elson? Must be even worse for a woman who loves a guy like that. Wouldn't you say, Mrs. Elsa? She could never escape it, couldn't she? The more she stood to lose, like wealth and social position, the worse it got until finally... Until finally... Finally, Edna Clooney was murdered. Edna Clooney ran up against a person like that just because she recognized an old friend who had a secret. She didn't know about the secret, but she did want to borrow money. And that's all it took, wasn't it? The killer could only figure one way. Blackmail. Everything was ruined. Suddenly, all the fears and all the suspicions that had been piling up for years broke loose, didn't they? Didn't they? Yes. Carol, don't. Yes. Yes, Lieutenant. I can't take any more. I had to do it. I had to kill her. I knew it from the instant Leonard told me she'd recognized him as Melvin Berry. No other way out, no other way. I left the bazaar, arranged to meet her in the park. When she said she wanted money, I grabbed her, choked her. Leonard didn't know anything about it. Until you came in with my keys. <laughs> okay. Give her some help, Elsa, until she gets hold of herself. And we'll all go downtown and put it on paper. The lineup, or before you pass the innocent... The Vagrant, The Thief, The Murderer. Listen again next week when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Greb, Sergeant Matt Greb. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number, then name and charge. If you have any questions or identifications, please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, add in heaven. 
The Lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie and Wally Mayer as Sergeant Matt Greb, is written by Gene Levitt and Bob Mitchell, with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Gil Stratton, Ted Osborne, Parley Bear, Herb Butterfield, Robert Griffin, and Virginia Gregg. The Lineup was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The big postseason football game of the year, the Rose Bowl contest between Michigan and California, will be broadcast next Monday, New Year's Day, over most of these same CBS stations. For action, color, excitement, be sure you're on hand for this great sports event, the Rose Bowl game between Michigan and California. Dan Coverly speaking. This is CBS, where you find songs for sale every Friday night at the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. And we have yet another case of crooks assuming everyone else um, must uh, be uh, crooked. And, of course, the poor lady who was killed had no idea about the the secret. But uh, they uh, it was assumed that the only reason she would be asking for a loan or for money to help out her son was not for old time's sake, but uh, because she knew about the secret. Uh, and leads to a bit of a tragic end here. All right, well, that'll do it for today. Join us tomorrow. We'll be bringing you a video theater episode, one last episode of the Court of Last Resort, uh, ahead of next week being the final episode we have of uh, A Life in Your Hands. Our listener support campaign continues. Uh, support us at support.greatdetectives.net. Uh, follow the program on Twitter at Radio Detectives and... Uh, Be sure and fill out our listener survey, survey survey.greatdetectives.net. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.